All right, guys, I'm here with Giovanni. Let's see if anybody, let's first of all, make sure that we are live. Uh, let me see. Oh yeah, we're live uh, with Giovanni. Okay, guys, nobody's, nobody's yet on. Probably gonna be very soon. Let's see. Uh, well, we can start. Let's, let's just start. Let's not worry about yeah. it. We're gonna get a ton of people on this thing. We have 450 people already. Okay, good. All right, so, uh, hey guys, thanks for tuning in. Uh, you know, we did this first deep dive of the power law that Giovanni discovered a long, long time ago, uh, about a month ago. And it's, it's really interesting because now every time I talk to somebody, they're like, Fred, what about these power laws? <laughs> it's like everywhere I go now, in life, uh, on Twitter, on YouTube, I always hear people about power law. So it really has kind of, this meme has per, uh, permeated, I think, the internet. And uh, we're here with the, the really the person who first discovered it, which is Giovanni. So we're going to take a, a, a refresher course on power laws with Giovanni. And then we're going to dive into some of the more recent stuff because when we first talked about power laws uh, m a month or two ago, um, you know, Giovanni, since then, Giovanni has made all kinds of other uh, discoveries and observations, some of which I'm not even up to date on. So uh, Giovanni's going to explain that, and uh, we're just going to have leave it open. We also have a chat. Uh, let me make sure the chat, uh, okay, the chat is there. Oh, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Oh, bad echo, Fred. Good. Let's get our audio right. Um, that should be better uh, for the audio. And uh, all right, Giovanni, it is up to you. Uh, I have slides here, so here's the slides, and you can drive. Great. And um, uh, buongiorno, everybody. Uh, thank you to come and listen to us. Hopefully you learned something and we learn from you too, from your questions. So I wanted to give you a quick uh, introduction, uh, assuming that, you know, like you say, meme, uh, the meme is that everybody knows about it, but maybe um, you, you need to refresh a little bit uh, what uh, uh, we mean with the power law, why it's relevant uh, for Bitcoin and so on. So I'm going through these slides. This is the first slide. Basically, it's actually uh, one of my followers and by the way, Please come to uh, my ex too. Uh, maybe uh, Fred will have a link uh, after this. Definitely um, jo join uh, because you know Fred covers a lot of interesting things. It's a, a different style that is kind of complementary to mine. But you know, sometimes I cover other things that Fred doesn't. So okay. I think the combination of, of both of us it's uh, amazing. You know, uh, and I always tell people to follow uh, Fred because uh, he's kind of Lex Friedman of bitcoin he's, he's doing an amazing job but uh anyway um uh, the entire my entire approach uh from the beginning you know and they started in about uh 2013 when i, I read uh, uh one of my first articles on bitcoin uh was to study bitcoin as a science uh because i think bitcoin is science because bitcoin it's the many things right you can find out whatever you like in Bitcoin. But uh, being a scientist, being a physicist, uh, I wanted to see, uh, I wanted to look for science. I wanted to look for uh, things that I can rely on using mathematics, using logic, using data. So that is my approach. And here in this graph, this is what I'm trying to express because basically it's like, you know, the first uh, astronomers, the first scientists that started to look at the universe through the lens of science, using telescopes, using different tools. Uh, they discovered a lot of things and they made a lot of progress, right? And uh, one of my followers made this very beautiful picture. And uh, it's also, I uh, have this article about uh, the theory of Bitcoin. Am I using this as uh, uh, the main picture to uh, indicate this uh, idea uh, of approaching Bitcoin as a science? So the first graph I want to show you is this one. So this is what uh, everybody's familiar with, right? It's a typical graph that they usually show on TV when they want to talk about Bitcoin. Um, mostly to, in fact, Fred, what I, I saw, uh, he put it in such a nice way. I thought, yeah, he expresses exactly what is going on with this picture. Because if you see this picture, and in particular, 
it, not even the picture how people talk about Bitcoin, uh, in particular people that don't know about Bitcoin. Uh, many times I try to orange peel people and say, oh yeah, Bitcoin, that thing, if, if it was not a thing a couple of years ago, you know, they always think that this, there was something related to Bitcoin that they heard, and most of the time it's crashes, right? They don't even remember it was, a, or maybe they remember that went to 60,000, but then it crashed to, you know, they always remember wrong, you know, crash it to 2000, you know, maybe they remember the previous cycle. So we, we are, we are a picture of Bitcoin, it's even worse than this. Uh, we think that, uh, you know, it, it goes maybe up, then crashes, maybe it never recovered, you know. They have a, a very, um, you know, they don't have a clear picture of what is going on with Bitcoin. But even if you look at this graph, yeah, okay, it went up, uh, uh, it reached some peaks, then it went down. You cannot rely on it, you know. It's something that even if maybe overall, at, at least now, seems to go up, it's not something that you will put uh, your savings on, right? Most of the investors will think it's something completely unreliable and absurd, and we should not take a look. Uh, and then most of us that are uh, familiar with Bitcoin are more familiar with this graph. And this graph uh, is a, a graph where you are taking the log uh, you're taking the log of the y-axis. What the log does? The log does this operation. Basically, one of the things that we do as scientists, we write number as exponent because it's a nice way of representing numbers that are something that's some kind of phenomena. Um, let's say that I wanted to represent uh, uh, the size of many different animals from a mouse all the way to an elephant it would be a little funny if i did it in a linear fashion uh, because it spans so many different ranges and so one thing that we do we use this scientific notation scientific notation i know that people resist it and you know sometimes they tell me why don't you write real prices well these are real prices just that they're expressed in a slightly different way so you express them as what we call a scientific notation so it's very simple you're bitcoiners you're clever you can learn stuff right as you deal with bitcoin so it, let's do it uh 10 is 10 to the one right uh, basically so many zero zeros the number has 10 to the one is 10 uh 10 to the two is 100 10 to the thousand sorry 10, 10 1000 is 10 to the three so it's simple how how simple than that could be right you get used to it so in this scale for example one so zero will mean one because anything uh, raised to the zero is one and then one will be ten two will be hundred and so on the beauty of doing that is that now you linearize these things that we call scale scale is orders of magnitude so you're basically jumping uh in, in this spanning of a bitcoin price by factor of 10. so you go from 10 100 a thousand and so now you kind of linearize these scales, these jumps in 10. And the effect of doing this is that now you can see better, right? What if you look at the previous chart, the first few prices, right? So if we go back to the uh, previous chart, the first few prices, they are basically invisible, right? Because uh, they were all flat. You see, uh, it, uh, doing it linearly emphasizes the biggest number, but it doesn't give a small number room so you cannot even see them but if you do it in this way you see it's linearizing all these changes in time so you can actually see what happened early on and you can compare you can compare the proportional changes you can think even almost like a percentage the percentage changes at any given time in the history of Bitcoin. It's a very beautiful way it's one of the tools that uh, we use in science to describe data because you want to look at data in many different ways to learn from the data. When you do it in this way now, you see this path, right? It, uh, it's much more regular, it's much more precise. It seems that it's, something is going on there, you know? It's not so random and so crazy like it was before. Yes, there are these deviations, but almost with your eyes, you can trace this line, right? You can trace this line across there is like a middle line it's very clear now it was not clear before but there is some kind of pattern there right and and some people this is the famous rainbow chart that people uh talk about and uh, uh you know in the past but then it was more like a meme than anything else but it's not a meme if you are a scientist and look at something like this 
you immediately recognize there is something going on. There is some kind of a pattern. It's now, it's not easy to say what is the pattern because uh, it's a curve, right? And humans are not so good with curves. We are better with straight lines, but uh, it's still something organized and orderly. Um, now, a few other things, by the way, the stars are the alvings, right? The uh, alvings. Uh, these are deviations from the trend. Now, here, of course, I know already what the trend is. It's this famous power law. So I created deviations from this trend. Uh, and you can see them color coded, right? But uh, even the more classical um, rainbow chart, it's something like that. that. You know, they are some kind of way of, they didn't think in terms of power laws. They had some other approach, but still did it in terms of deviations, you know, from this, what it looks like a kind of general pattern for Bitcoin. It's a, it's a beautiful chart. It's, not, it's a nice chart. Uh, and, uh, and you can see, right, we, there are these deviations when we reach the bottom. The bottom seems also very regular. Then we go above uh, where there are these oscillations. But everything seems much more organized. Uh, now, the next chart I want to show you is this chart here, OK? I'm trying to go a little bit fast, etc. But uh, this when I had my big revelation, because I did something like this where I was plotting uh, basically the log in both axes, right? So I'm taking the log of the price before uh, we were taking just the log of the price, but we kept uh, the x-axis linear. We didn't change it you know, from the normal type of chart. But now we do something that many people are not familiar with. Physicists are very familiar, so we do all the time these kind of things. Because it's basically with this sequence that I show you, it's kind of almost what we do with data. We are trained to do that. First, we plot the normal data when we want to learn about phenomena. It can be anything in nature that we want to study. We do it linearly first. We get like a feeling of the data. If you don't see a pattern that is the most simple pattern that you can find is a straight line, right? If you see a straight line, we do have a straight line. Uh, we try to make some statement about how the data is related. We publish a paper and we go to the next study. If we don't, we do the next one. Uh, and I wanted to say something <coughs> about this previous one. Um, what uh, what one of the, the second type of uh, very common pattern that you will find in nature if it is not linear is what is called an exponential. So an exponential is a very fast process. They're usually linked with things that double themselves on a specific time. Maybe everybody is uh, from school. You learn that if you are compounding, your um, interest, right? Of course, if you're in a bank and, you know, you can make a joke that it will take you hundreds of years before you go anywhere, you know, because the compounding is so small. But uh, if you compound something where uh, you double, you double, you double, it's going to be an exponential. An exponential, it looks like in a normal chart like this, it will look like a hockey stick. It goes very, very fast. And uh, uh, in a chart like this, instead, where you're taking the log, of, uh, of of the y-axis, the exponential will look like a straight line. And you can see from this chart that Bitcoin is not a straight line in this type of chart. And in fact, it's a strange bending down curve. Now, most people will say, wait a second, even if I this chart is disordered, it still looks like it's going up. How is possible that it's going down in this one? Well, because it's, you have to, when you do this chart, you have to also to understand what we are trying to do. In this case, we are trying to compare it with this uh, process, like the exponential, that is a straight line. So anything that doesn't look like a, a straight line, it means that is uh, not necessarily going down, like you know you would think here, is simply uh, slowing down relatively to an exponential. So anything that is not uh, an exponential will look like bent in this way. So it's basically like losing ground relatively to an equivalent exponential process. So it, this is why it looks bent, but it's still going up and going up pretty, pretty fast. Now, the next thing that we do, if we don't see a straight line, because we are trying to look at for a straight line, that is what human beings like, right? If I see a straight line, it's a simple thing. I can understand it. You know, even scientists are a little monkeys. You know, we are all monkeys. and monkeys like straight lines you know i had actually some some people telling me that i thought this is really cool because even now scientists are, are monkeys you know we're still monkeys and so when i see something like that the monkey in me says whoa you know i i found something i like this you know 
And in, how did they get this straight line? You can see it's a straight line, right? Bitcoin, even if it is oscillating and it's going up and down relatively to this middle, cent uh, middle straight line, it's a straight line. It's the price get straightened up, and it's so weird, right? Uh, that at the beginning, when you see this, they say well, maybe something is wrong with the data. This guy did something wrong. No, I did what is called a log log graph. It's a again one of the tricks in our arsenal where uh, we are looking for a pattern. We are trying to understand what is going on with the data. And so this is one of the last. Uh, weapon that we have in physics you know the last transformation is like a pokemon you know that uh, the last form of uh, of, a, of this thing that we are studying and it became something that it's amazing right and now you can see this straight line it looks it cannot be by chance i love fred when he says hey you can take a penny and drop it and it will go how do you call it fred what is the little cup of it uh, what is the name of the cup? We call it a Dixie cup. A and, Dixie and... cup. A Dixie cup. You go to the parcel building on top of it, you drop a penny, and and it goes in the Dixie cup. That is the chance that this thing is. And I'd like to point out here, Giovanni, just for people listening, it's sort of one because I saw somebody saying, wait a second, I I look at the stock market and it's also a power law. Mm -hmm. And uh, you pointed out quite correctly, I think, that. Wait, you looked at the stock market over, you know, over 10 years or 15 years, and you're you're saying, okay, it's sort of a power law. But the most important thing here is the the range of data here, right? We're looking yeah. at Bitcoin price from you know below a dollar to Bitcoin price at a hundred almost at a hundred thousand dollars, right? Yeah, and and in fact, uh, we expressing the dates here. Uh, you know, these are dates which so people know which date it is, but actually uh, we usually have days, right? Days from uh, the uh, beginning of Bitcoin. So basically, how old Bitcoin is? Is it one day old, two days old? And so, even if you don't see it here, because uh, you know markets started to operate around 2010, so this is when we have actually some real data. We actually force it in a sense by using this uh, way of counting time to go all the way to uh, time zero. Uh, that is around when it was created. So actually, in a sense, uh, we are already including all this data that are now there. So, you know, we are talking about when Bitcoin was, you know, a billionth of a dollar or something like that, you know. Uh, and so even if you just consider what is in the chart right now. It's kind of like about... the uh, beginning of the universe, right? We have to, yeah, exactly. we have to, we have to look at, you know, T minus, you know, at power uh 10 to the power negative 25 yeah the very true. beginning of the universe we have to look at negative 25 is very important for us yeah know? yeah exactly and so you see um uh, when, in fact uh, i will tell you in a moment that these weird numbers that are here on top of the chart what that uh, what is their significance because it's relatively simple and by the way, I forgot, I say, I'm going to add a, a slide today, uh, but I will give you a link. I, I, I have made a video that is three hours. <laughs> so when you have a chance, please, but I spend a lot of time and putting- Le Less is better. Let, let's just, let's I keep know, I know. it condensed. Yeah, I know, yeah. no, but uh, whenever you have a chance, if you have a, if you want to put a link, because it's almost like a Wikipedia, you can, mm -hmm. I made a lot of eyes for yeah. putting a, like little timestamps so you can go there because I try to explain and I use a tool, it's a very beautiful tool, but maybe Fred, you can start to use it. Uh, it's a free tool called Desmos, and you can put the equation, and then you can move around the line and say, hey, when, when Bitcoin was a dollar, how long did it take to reach a dollar? How much did it take to reach $10? I will show you later how to use it. It's really cool. Um, but um, uh, yeah, so you can ask all kinds of questions like that. So but basically, when you see something like that as a scientist, right, before you draw the line before you draw the bands etc you immediately know that something is going on uh, i was trying to get uh fred attention before we became friends for days i was posting on his uh account you know fred look at me look at me look at my chat and finally one day he did it you know and he looked at the chat i don't remember exactly but it was something like uh is it it is clear that uh bitcoin is in a power law train a stoppable power law train and said finally you know <laughs> because i saw fred this clever guy mathematician from stanford i say he needs to learn about this and when he saw it 
I knew, I knew that he would recognize because he's any clever person that knows a little bit of math. He sees this. Everybody and, and can knows. figure this out for themselves if they yeah. do the work. If they they need to to do the work. So what's the blue line? So explain so this the blue, blue line. line well, I, I put it in addition there to show that actually I didn't represent the first one because it's weird um, bubble that uh, okay. we don't know what happened, why it was created, but all the others seem to be. And I know I saw your video about the bubble, and we can spend a little bit of time later to talk about the bubble, but. They seem to be associated in the sense that they happen on regular times after the uh, alvings, yeah. uh, and there are reasons why they are happening, and they are happening in a very regular fashion. So, like about four years, very very precise four years. So, if you draw a lot, if you make a, like a sine wave that oscillates with a period of four years, and you kind of synchronize it with the first bubble that is a trick, right? That I did I synchronize mm -hmm. it on purpose? Then the other one follow. You know, oh, the other ones that seem to be there at a very regular fashion. So it was a kind of a first attempt to kind right. of include the bubbles in this model, right? Um, but uh, what is important is actually the orange line. The orange line. And what are the uh, different? Also, just just for uh, yeah. just for the record, what are the what defines the green, the yellow, the orange, and the yeah, red? Yeah, so first orange. let me tell you what is the orange line, and then we can define the yeah. others in yeah. terms of the orange line. So the orange line, uh, so remember what we do as scientists, right? We want to find some kind of a pattern that describes the data, what people call a model. This is what we call a model. And many times we even call it a law because people confuse some of this scientific term uh, in science, a law means a pattern, a pattern. Now, if a red pattern is established, you know, like the law of gravity for a long time, and then there are so many experiments that confirm it through, it becomes, you know, a law with the big L, you know, in a certain sense. But a law in general means a pattern, some kind of very precise pattern that is not there by chance. It's mm -hmm. a relationship between data. In this case, we are trying to find a relationship between price and time, right? Is there a, pre a precise relationship? If you see something like this, yes, there is, okay? Any scientist worth his salt knows it is. Now, you can do some more sophisticated calculation, more sophisticated tests, and we did all of them. In fact, even Fred's friends, you know, his astrophysicist friend. Now, we have scenes in our little army of uh, power of fanatics, you know, since he's this finance professor, he did a beautiful study where he took alpha of the data in the beginning, he, he pre tried to predict the other alpha, and he was able to predict them, then included all the data, and he showed that there's not much difference, you know, if you include only alpha. We did all kinds of sophisticated tests, but the first thing you do, you draw this line. What is this line? You, there is a mathematical method called regression. We don't draw it by hand. Uh, we use the computer, and what the computer does is basically find a line it is trying to minimize the distance of all the points, right? So you tried many different combinations until the computer says, look, I found this line is the best line, the best fitting line, because if, if it has these characteristics of minimizing the distance of each point. It's the line that makes most data points happy in a certain sense, right? And the meaning, the meaning of that is that basically you can treat it almost like an average is an average of the behavior of these points. Now, remember what these points represent. They don't represent exactly the price. It represents the log of the price. They don't represent the time. They represent the log of time. What is the, the significant? That scale. Remember that scale. So these little numbers that are on top of this 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4. So what is linearized, what behaves like a line, it's the scale. It's going up by a factor of 10, by a factor of 10. Okay, that is the cool thing. And once you draw that line, so the computer gives you two numbers. It gives you the slope, because this is how you define as a line, right? If you study in school, they tell you a line is defined by two things, the slope and the y-intercept. The slope is turns out to be something like 5.82. So a number in the beginning, of course, this is how when you explore things, you have no clue what this number is. It's something close to six. It's interesting. You make a note of it. You're trying to learn. Then the other number that is here, you can see on top, is 10 to the minus 17. So 
Oh, 10 to the minus 17, remember, if I took this line, I went all the way backwards, right? There would be a point where there is time zero that is not shown in the chart because we didn't have data. We have some little data that is like some of the earlier transactions. So there is one of Satoshi friends, one of his inner circle people. I don't remember his name, maybe the audience remember, but he did one of the earliest transactions, but the, the earliest transaction between dollar and Bitcoin. I think it was early in 2009 sometime. I don't remember exactly when, but basically sold. It was, they were trying to show that you can buy and sell Bitcoin. You know, they were using PayPal. People would, if I send you a Bitcoin, get a wallet. Okay, send me the money by PayPal. It was really primitive like that. And he sold uh, 10,000 Bitcoin for $1. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? And actually, I put that data point there after. That was before the pizza data that point. was before the pizza it was at the earliest recorded transaction ever and so even uh, that data and the pizza data both fit the model yeah the pizza data actually we because it came later he actually the guy kind of asked uh, for uh like two pizza for uh, 10, 000, again, Bitcoin, ten thousand. Yeah. it was a bad deal it was a bad deal because it was actually one of a few data points that is uh, like an outlier i put all I found, I looked for all these early transactions and they became like little dots instead of mm -hmm. being like a continuous line, right? And almost all of them fall on the line. That one was like an outlier. So he got a bad deal even at that time. But it was a cool thing, right? Because it showed that you actually could buy stuff. But we definitely dollars. have data around 10 cents. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, and uh, even if you included this little the early data, they fall on this straight line. It is amazing, you know. And then mm -hmm. you can ask questions, like you say, okay, well, I want to look at where uh, Bitcoin, a long Bitcoin, it took to uh, go one dollar, and it falls on the line. You know, it's, it's, it's really amazing. It's uh, incredible. So um, that's ten to the minus seventeen. What is the significance? Well, think about what. Uh, so basically, the first thing that happens when you get this line, you get some kind of uh, relationship, right? Remember now it's a relationship between this log quantity. So if you go back and it's a little math, you know, it's in my video, you know, you can learn about it, but uh, um, it, it basically you get something that looks like this. It's on top of the chart, but the price is equal to some constant, that constant is this very small number, 10 to the minus 17 means zero, 16 zeros, one, right? Uh, and um, so it's a this small constant multiply the time. So you give me a time, and the time is days from when Bitcoin was born. So one day after it was born, ten days. Right now we are about, and you can do it. You can try to do it with a calculator. Mm -hmm. Put uh, uh, I think we are five thousand five hundred something days, right? Round it up to five hundred uh, five thousand six hundred. Put mm -hmm. five thousand six hundred there. Take the power of six because you can run. You can round it up but the real number is really 5.82 and then multiply by this very very small number so you will need a calculator 10 to the minus 17 right so basically uh, the first day if you if you look at this formula so the, when bitcoin was created because it was zero right time zero so you take the zero to the power of something is always zero you multiply by a number another number is zero so the price was zero. This is what this formula is telling us. The day the Bitcoin was created, it was literally worth zero. I know that it's difficult to believe that Bitcoin is worth zero, but it was. It's the second day, you know, the first day after creation, after the Big Bang, uh, you take one to the power of six, basically. So it's when you take the power, it's basically multiplying, right? You have one times one times one. You do this six times, you get one. And now you take this one and you multiply by 10 and 17. That was the price, 10 to the minus 17 dollars after one dollar, one day. That is basically 100 uh, million billion of a dollar. You know, this is how much it was worth the first day. That is the significance of that 10 to the minus 17. It's basically it's give us a way. But then to we still on. have Giovanni. We, we, yeah. We, the, the colored bands. What are what are those? Let's just yeah go yeah yeah. And, and the color band. And let me tell you one more last thing about this formula, and then we will move to the band. So one curious thing you can always say, right? You can say, how long did it take then, according to the formula, to uh, get one dollar, right? And you can because uh, you can also reverse it and solve for time, right? Right? Or if you have a, like a something that 
like I was telling you, this Desmos app, you can draw that line for you and you can move along the curve and find when it was $1. And when you look at the time, the time it was about 800 days and go and look uh, when you have a chance on the chart when actually the real Bitcoin was $1 and it was about 900 days. So the formula tell us 150 days, the real data tell us the Bitcoin reached $1. 900 days and you can try to do it with 10 day, ten dollars under dollar it's incredible precise within like a few days like a, a some time maybe just a couple of months off you know it's incredible now the, the, because of we have these oscillations you know because of, that is not the, the thing that they were wrong it's not not it's not about the model it's about bitcoin because these crazy things of oscillating so it's already crazy that we can find such a thing, simple formula to represent it um, and as these incredible oscillations though we need to find a way of dealing with this oscillation so one day one way of dealing it deal with it is measuring how far the coin goes um, relative to this general trend and there are a few things to notice first of all because I hear this all the time, say, oh, but okay, you found the general path, but how can I use it? It's not useful. It is useful because it's not that Bitcoin is, uh, and British Auto likes to, to say this, I'm sorry if I make fun of him. He will be right if Bitcoin was randomly, if it was like a little cloud of dots, and this cloud of dots representing the price of Bitcoin, where at any time it can do anything crazy around this line, right? then it will still tell us the general trend, but it will be much less useful because it will be all over the place. It's not. You can see the Bitcoins as very precise behavior around this line. It's so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to just explain that uh, in, in different words, right? Yeah. In different words, if you're at a, a high point in this graph relative to the trend line, there's a mean reversion back to the trend line. If you're at a low point in this graph relative to the trend line, there's also a mean reversion back to the trend line. So okay. it's not the case that like a Brownian motion where or a random walk where if you go up, you have equal chance of going back up or down. Right. Yeah. So it, there really is. It is, in a sense, a valuation model. Right. So it yeah. basically says at this particular point, which was the. 2017 peak right you're you're kind of you know are we, are you supposed to hodl well you know you can but it's probably you have a much higher chance of going down and and and, correct. and correcting right and this way is the same colors, as true. right yeah this yeah. colors red the danger because it means you are in a region where it's much and what, more what is what are the colors like mathematically yeah the, so basically they are a, a percentage based on uh, standard deviation. So you calculate the average distance of the points from the right. um, from the trend, and then right. you mul you say, okay, I, how much uh, uh, am I? You know, twenty percent of the standard deviation. I mean, thirty percent. I am two times. You know, it's basically a way of representing how far you are from the trend. And what is so? What is the lowest green line, for example? The lowest green line is about forty percent from the trend, 40, 50 okay. percent from the trend. And look at how incredibly precise it is. In fact, if you pay attention, you start to right. study because these things need to be studied. You need to spend some time and look at the chart and try to make sense of it. Look out, for example, in the first few cycles. Uh, it was almost scary because the price during what we call the bear markets, that are not bear because we are going up anyway, uh, it's very, it's almost contained by that green. But market. I would say this, I would say this, because people have, have, have said, you know, and, and a lot of people have gotten in trouble because they sort of say the green line is the absolute low. It can never violate this line. This is not, there's no absolutes in any of this stuff, right? It, this is just a statistical model, and uh, you could go below the green line. There's nothing. There's nothing. Well, well uh, let me actually uh, agree and disagree with you. Okay. And I don't know okay. if I have a graph of that. Okay. Uh, if I have right. this graph here. Okay. So this graph here, I'm trying to emphasize that line by uh, eliminating the outliers. The outliers yeah. are basically, you know, I can do a mathematical calculation where uh, I um basically say any 
deviations that is really large from the uh, trend, okay. uh, call it an outlier. And you can, you know, there is a mathematical way of doing that. And what this does, it highlights these points that are less of a deviation, that right. are basically the bottom, because the bottom turns out to be about one standard deviation from the trend. The peaks tend to be two standard deviations from the peak, from the trend. And so what it does, it highlights this bottom. So in a way, you are right. We go some time below, but very little, very little. It's almost like no. no I'm I, a, I'm agreeing that it's, it's, statistically it's very interesting. But I'm what I what I'm saying is where you can get in trouble if you use a lot of leverage, and you're saying, yeah, yeah, of course, I yeah, of course. I am only gonna I'm gonna. This model predicted that I could never go below the the bottom no, that line. That is never like that because uh, it, you, you know can't, the, this model does not give you that certainty. Now with with science, with science you yeah. know, uh, you have to, uh, there is never certainty about anything, even the planets. But when you deal with planets, this stuff becomes much more precise, right? By the time you go to animals, because you can apply the same type of science to animals, biology, etc., you start to get a lot of noise and it becomes less precise. You can start to see that these points are a little bit more scatters along these kind of models. But then by the time you include human activity and financial stuff, you get even more noise. But in terms of being a financial asset, it's incredible that we actually have this very precise trend. It's amazing. It's another confirmation that we are dealing with something that is not really quite an asset. So of course you don't want to be a degen and start to do crazy things like super high leverage, but it gives you a validity of this model, but also a usefulness because the other thing that people say is not useful. No, it's incredibly useful. And this where maybe me and Fred deviate a little bit because I intend to use it to actually do DCA. I intend to use it to actually uh, take some gains when uh, you know I am in a region that I think will bring the price down because. It, that is also what science does. Science allows you to make applications. You know, this is why we can have cars, telephones, and so on, because we apply the science that we learn. Science will be really useless if we cannot apply. And you can apply this science. Now, of course, it depends on your style. It depends on your vision. It depends on many Bitcoin you have. If you have a lot of Bitcoin, probably it's better to sit on this Bitcoin. If you have a little Bitcoin and you want to multiply, maybe you want to very right. carefully, very... Uh, in a very aware way, in a very careful way, you want to use some of this knowledge. And there is a lot of alpha here, right? What in Wall Street call alpha, the ability to actually beat the market. You can do it because Bitcoin is so incredibly regular and precise, but if you are study and you understand what you're doing it and you're not doing it in a the gen way, then you can take advantage. You can start to DCA in this region where you're saying, well, look, is where I am in this range where the price is going is reaching a, a bottom. If you're in this, if you're in that kind of low area, yeah, great time to do DCA. Exactly. Great time, right? Yeah. If you're that's at that's the true. absolute peak, you may want to postpone it a little bit. Right. Exactly. You know, wait, you may wait. you may you may exactly. actually want to take a little bit of off the top. Um, exactly. Can exactly. we go back to use, let's go back yeah, to the sure. the actual order of the slides because I really want to stick with the order. Um, sure, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, but um, um, yeah, yeah, so yeah. you know there is a lot of information, a lot of knowledge. You can use these right. bands. Uh, you can add on top of that also because we are trying to make a, what we call the full model. So I have this full model where I combine both the general trend, the power law, but also the cyclic because I. You know, this is one of the things that uh, we do in science. Uh, uh, we combine different types of information. And I will tell you in a moment why actually this thing that is a power law helps us also for the long-term prediction. Because uh, there are two places where scientists uh, uh, can do prediction. One is when you have a phenomenon like this that is called scale invariant. So it's not uh, another line. It's not another line. It's not... Uh, just I'm drawing the line, or it's not another model. We found something that is one of the most precious, one of the most beautiful relationship in the universe that have these beautiful power laws. Power laws come up in nature all over the place. And in fact, you know, this is the next slide. So what do we mean for power law? Power law, like we just mentioned, is any time you have a relationship of this kind where you have Y, and then you have some constant, and then you have a 
the quantity, the other quantity that you are trying to understand. In this case, for Bitcoin is price and time. And then you have some kind of a power. So this is how we call it. This is why it's called a law, because it's a relationship. Remember what law means. Some people get torn off by this term. It all what it means that you are finding some kind of very regular, precise relationship between two quantities. And the power comes from this thing, where you are taking the power, you are raising to the power, uh, and oh, it's called also an exponent. And I would also like to mention, I would also like to mention that whether you measure time in days or years, the power is going to be the same. It's going to yeah. be the same. The A the, number is less important check. than the yeah. power, right? Correct. So. This the most important number here is this. This is not so much important. The focus should be on this. And I will tell you in a moment why, because it's a very fundamental number. It tell us a lot of information. Because again, this is not any other type of relationship. In fact, exponentials are less important less useful less powerful than the power laws and and, and i would say they're, they're look uh, one of the things i will point out everybody's saying fred like everything's going to collapse we're going to have etfs we're going to have this we're going to go completely hyper exponential and i'm like well no and you know we can't exponentials are something that are as you said earlier they're fundamentally unstable right and if Bitcoin kept doubling, you know, exponentially, it just doubles. If, let's, let's say the price of Bitcoin doubles every four years, every two years, whatever it is, every year, right? At some point, I will be able to buy in t New York City with one Bitcoin, right? So, uh, you know, people think, well, it's going to go up forever. Yeah. It can go up, but it can't right. go up exponentially forever because Correct. otherwise, one Bitcoin, I'm going to buy New York City. And, and, and this is... Yeah, and this is one of the things that I try to communicate to people with this. First of all, it's very fast because by the time you have six here, you're, it's almost on, almost for the human eyes indistinguishable from an exponential. But it's a same type of exponential. It's an a, um, intelligent kind of exponential. Nature likes these kind of things and this type of relationship come up all the way all the place in in nature because they are and you will have to study and learn books there is an entire book that i suggest everybody should be almost as important if not more important than bitcoin standard it's called scale okay this book's called scale Fantastic by book, and i would also mention not just in nature but in cities in social, in social events so this in is the social, next slide right? where i show why is not another you know is not another line it's not another feat uh, uh it's so incredible that we found this thing in bitcoin because it puts bitcoin in this universe of natural phenomena and if you say natural phenomena it means also humans because we are also human but many people confuse that because they think oh humans cannot be described by mathematical law that is stupid that is what i'm sorry Austrian economics says it is wrong. If it is wrong, it is wrong. You know, it's wrong because yes, human can be described by mathematics. We, humans can be described. Even, even the terror number of terrorist attacks <laughs> are power laws. Okay, the one, the one that, that, the one that I looked at that, that really resonated for me from that book was the amount of patents yeah. filed by a human. Right, depends on the the population the population of the city. So yeah, if you, you live in, if you live in bigger of cities, of, you're gonna yeah. you're gonna produce more patents. The, the log of of uh, patents versus the log of people yeah. in a city, it's a power law. And yeah. here you, I show a kind of power laws, a, a relationship between the mass of an animal and how much energy the animal uh, uses. And we know that they are power law because notice how the scale, right, is uh, not going up in numbers by ten. Um, it's uh, in one scale, and then the other tens, right? One, ten, hundred. So we know that is a power law. This is a log log graph. And in a log log graph, uh, a power law will look like a straight line. If it was this uh, a linear graph, it would look like a bent curve because the exponent here is a uh, three quarter. So every every power law, it's determined by this exponent. The exponent of the power is almost like a fingerprint or it's like the dna of that phenomena every phenomena has a different power that tells a story that tells us something 
about the mechanism. And I will say we don't necessarily understand it. So for example, why is the power law of patents? It's like 1.2, right? It's super yeah. We don't know, right? There's no- Many times theory. you don't know. We don't know. Exactly. We don't know what it but is about patents if you, that if cause you, us if to you, grow 1.2. Right. But, but that is a Bitcoin, motivation for study, for yeah. scientists to study and trying to explore it. Because if you get it, then it's a, first of all, now you discover something amazing because now you yeah. have something to play with and then you can go deeper. This is how science works, right? Now, okay, it's created by that. So what does it mean? What goes behind? Like this how, for example, we discover the law of gravity when we study the planets. We didn't know what that little number was. And then by a Newton came about, almost 100 years passed by. For 100 years, we use this equation. We could uh, uh, use it to predict the eclipses. And, you know, we made a lot of progress in science, but we didn't know. Then so let's came let's about. move on, but I just want to summarize yeah, this. No, let me tell you. summarize this yeah. by, by saying, this idea that Bitcoin fits in a power law fits in a general not just physical thing, but in a general uh, socioeconomic analysis of scale uh, by people like Jeffrey West, right? And, right? and other researchers. And so it's it's very natural and very it's very good that Bitcoin fits into this, this pattern, I yeah, think. Yeah, because there are a lot of uh, properties. Uh, if you read the book, you will learn about power laws that are associated with resilience, is associated with uh, energy conservation. Like, for example, one way of thinking about this is that Bitcoin somehow organizes itself, all the interaction between the miners, uh, the adopters, uh, the price, the market, all these things organize themselves through little interactions in such a way of finding the least resistance path. So basically, in another way of thinking, the Bitcoin found this wisdom to follow the least resistance path to what it needs to do, that is to become the monetary system of the world. That is, don't argue with Bitcoin. If you are arguing, say, I want it to be exponential, you are arguing with Bitcoin and found through its wisdom, through the wisdom of the crowd, the wisdom of interaction, the most powerful, the most uh, energy saving, the most, you know, the least resistant path to what it wants to do. So you are arguing with the wisdom of Bitcoin. That is what Bitcoin decided to do over 15 years, over nine order of magnitude, if included this early transaction. So basically going from like being a dust speck all the way to the Himalayas mountain. And he did it with this wisdom of growing in this very particular fashion. So this is the beauty and the power of this. It's much deeper than any other think that I heard, heard about Bitcoin. So, and I was trying to tell you that if you discover the meaning of that number, you go much deeper, you go, you fall in this uh, rabbit hole and this incredible world opens because uh, for example, we did it with the planets and science in a sense started from understanding this power law. We started to discover the law of gravity, Newton came about and all the beautiful things that we have in life, cars, telephone, computers, come from that, come from a power law. This is how important these power laws are, okay? And then when we studied animals, we found out that this three quarter that I mentioned has a meaning. And we, you know, we don't go into details, but uh, you, you can read it in the book or you can come to my ex because we discussed it and so on and so on. But there is a lot of meaning there. Now, I, I was struggling for a long time about understanding that six, what where the camp where it comes from, what the heck. And finally, and I want also to thank the X community because you kind of pushed me. I did more progress in this uh, time that I started to interact with you. This is the beauty, and this is also probably why Fred does it, because we learn a lot of things by interacting with you. So I thank you to help me with that. Because one night I was talking to you guys, we were discussing things, and I went to sleep. And I couldn't sleep because I was thinking about this damn six and the entire picture came to my mind. I started to go back to the computer. I started to look at the data and this is what I found. Okay. I found this. I found that if you plot all the different parameters that are relevant for Bitcoin, for example, the addresses, the addresses are a measure of the activity of the uh, network because, you know, you can think about uh, Bitcoin as a network where uh, different people interact with each other, the average machines that are part 
of the networking of the mining machines, we have the miners. It's a big in interaction between machine and humans. These networks of intelligence, information, energy, they ask power laws all over the place, okay? Uh, I, I, I joke, I make the meme that uh, as power law out of the wazoo, okay? So uh, the ad addresses that are a measure of activity, it's a proxy, right? But it's a power law. The hash rate, it's a power law. And I would also just like to say addresses measured in many different ways, or like if you say addresses that hold 0 0.01 Bitcoin, power law. Yeah. 0 so 0.1 the, power law. Yeah, in this One case, Bitcoin, uh, in this law. example, and we can go deeper a little bit to show you different type of addresses, but in this example, I'm using all the addresses that are uh, known zero balance. So anything that doesn't have a zero balance, it is included here. But you can do, uh, like Fred says, uh, you know, with different cutoffs and then see, okay, how these address vary, how these, and we can look at it. It's one of the new things that I discovered recently. So you, so all of them are power laws in time and power laws of each other. So basically when you do all the possible combination of time, uh, power law, you know, addresses versus time, hash rate versus time, price versus time, but also price versus addresses, hash rate versus uh, addresses, price versus hash rate, and so on, you get power loss. And you basically you get six of them. They are all power loss. It's incredible. It's unbelievable. And now the thing I notice is, okay, the addresses, so basically the number of Bitcoiners, because it's kind of an indirect measures of many of us that are there, it grows with the cube of time. And then it turns out that the relationship between price and addresses, it's close to two, not exactly, but close to two. And that is something that if you study networks is a classical result, it's called the Metcalf law, where these scientists uh, many years ago, like in, I think it was uh, in the 30s or in the 50s, do you remember uh, 50s, right? In the 50s, he said, that if you have a network, the value of a network will be proportional to the number, to the square of the users, to the square of the people that use all the nodes, right? The number of telephones, for example, that you have uh, in a network of telephone landlines. He was, he, he didn't have uh, cell phones at the time. He didn't have computers. He was- So if, if, you, if you remember the, if you have an ethernet cable, an ethernet cable, like the, the cable, you have to thank Bob Metcalf. He invented the Ethernet cable, and uh, and I've met him. And I've met Mr. Metcalf, and uh, we have we have actually we met back in the '90s. But uh, he wrote an article about me, actually. Yeah. And I'll, so I'll you know, it, if, if you have a real network, you don't expect exactly two because uh, it's kind of an ideal result. Is a, a calculation when he did it. Uh, you know, you always start from an ideal situation and then. You look at uh, the less ideal situation. This is how we do it in science. And his ideal situation where everybody is connected with everybody else, he got to. So it's not surprising that in a real network where it's not going to be ideal, you know, there'll be one person who's more connected than the other, you know, like a, somebody like Fred has a lot of connections in the network, uh, uh, the Bitcoin network. There is the other guy that just bought it and never talks to anybody. It's, it's almost not connected with anybody. So it's going to be, no, it's not going to be ideal, but it's a number that is very, very close. And now it could be a coincidence, but uh, when you do it with another number of addresses and it comes also very close to two, you do it with another very close to two. So it's not a coincidence anymore. So this is basically Metcalf law. You combine these two because basically you're saying, okay, the price then is going to be uh, proportional to the addresses, but then the addresses are proportional to time. So price as a function of time needs to be connected with these two things. Look what happens. If you take this 1.7, multiply by that 3.1, you get 5.71 and the real slope, because the slope is that exponent, it's 5.65. It's basically a 1% difference. So I found what that GAM6 is it's the combination of these two things but it's like incredible it's basically like newton finding why we have the power law that we call kepler's law and this was the beginning of science this is the beginning of bitcoin science okay this is how big this discovery is and i'm sorry that it seems that i'm emphasizing you know my, myself it's not i'm emphasizing how beautiful amazing bitcoin is because as a scientist you are just an observer you're a 
a witness. You know, it's not about your ego. It's about the beauty of what you're discovering. And that is my song, you know, my song about Bitcoin. This is how beautiful and amazing Bitcoin is. And when I, dis when I found out, I was like, I couldn't sleep. I was amazing. This is beautiful, you know. And there are reasons why it goes up with the, uh, the cube. So I, because many people think uh, if you have a technology, it will be adopted with this thing that is called an S-curve. But it is not. Uh, it's a power law. And then I found this is weird. So I started to look at the literature, and there is a, like an enormous quantity of papers uh, that uh, uh, talk about how if you have something like a virus that is spreading, and this is a virus of the mind, right? You telling other people about Bitcoin, the information about Bitcoin spreading through the population. If you have some kind of, uh, if you have a, there are conditions like, if you have a uh, not perfect uh, transfer of information where everybody's connected with each other and you have super spreaders like uh, Fred, for example, or maybe even me, um, you're going to go from an S-curve to a power law. And in fact, there are examples like, for example, hates. I know that it's a bad analogy, you know, they're associated, but it's think about it like it's some kind of spreading mechanism, right? So it's AIDS is a good example of that where people, you know, it was like a spreading that is uh, governed by thinking because, you know, you know about the illness and so maybe don't have sex as much as before because of AIDS. You take precautions like, you know, uh, protection uh, during sex. So there is some kind of decision making. Guess what? The spread of AIDS went up with the power of three. Of time so and there are many other diseases exactly the same thing COVID same thing okay so there are many different situations like that where there is the spread of a disease the spread of information that becomes a power law and when I found it say okay now we got it we got it it's incredible it's fantastic you know there is this one-to-one -one, uh, connection and analogy we can study better we can try to um, understand it you know we can go deeper on this and then it turns out that also the ash rate the ash rate is the square root of, of uh, so there is a relation between price and ash rate where price is the square root of ash rate and then if you look at the evolution in time of the ash rate it's the power of 12 that is going fast well if price is going with the six 12 is even faster that is crazy uh, and so you know now you have a, like a this chart and you can look at how they interact. And so basically I created a theory. So we went from being a model to a full theory, a coherent theory of what Bitcoin is. So what is the difference? The theory, when you make a scientific theory, it is, you know, like Darwin theory of evolution or the Newton's theory about motion and gravity. You basically have like a, a little picture of how everything works in this world, you know, like in this case, Bitcoin. And you try to explain almost every phenomena on the, at the light of this theory. And the theory is that we are dealing with a network. There are all these interactions between all these power laws and they influence each other in a loop. And this loop, I didn't invent this loop. Uh, I think it's even in Bitcoin standard, if I remember. So I lifted from there. But I say, look, it's not just a bunch of words. It's actually proven by math and data, you know, empirical evidence. So for every step, we have one of these power law that represents one of these steps in this circle where, you know, they, we have a demand of a, of a store of value that goes up. And you can start from anywhere because it's a circle. But they say, OK, Satoshi created Bitcoin. There was a big demand for it, uh, not, you know, in terms of the first user because uh, they wanted to learn, they wanted to join this new thing, you know, but there were not many, right? They were very little. And then that made the price goes up. In the beginning, it was no price, it was value, perceived value, right? It was not yet traded, but uh, more people joined in uh, and we know the equation for that and exactly how it's related, you know, with the number of users, you know, and then the mining, goes up, yes, it goes up, and there is this power, right, between uh, price and ash rate. And then, you know, there is this difficulty adjustment that uh, he introduces, which is another feedback loop, and that creates some kind of pressure on the ash rate, and that brings more security to the system, that people feel more confident about uh, 
uh, the network, and so they join in, and the thing goes on and on and on like this. I like the wheel, the wheel aspects. Very cool. yeah, it's fantastic, right? It's beautiful. Yeah, in fact, wheel. I made even uh, an analogy, and they say it's like an Ouroboros, you know, this ancient symbol of uh, it's the dragon, it's a dragon, you know, that hits his own tail. There is this ancient symbol called the Ouroboros. That, uh, that I, I thought it was supposed to eat the fiat. Instead of it's, eating it's it a fiat too, you know, it's a it's it is on tail to go around in a circle, you know, so it's a feedback loop, but it's also a dragon that eats fiat, you know, and it's also a city because we are also studied that uh, cities right behave like power laws, you know, there are these all these beautiful analogies that make sense and they create uh, you know connections with our mythology of the coin that people like seller use his own intuition but i'm not sure if seller knows about this because it's actually supporting with data and math and logic the things it says so instead of being some kind of metaphor now it's actually a very precise analogy that makes sense and it's true it's based on truth i would so, say if anybody has access to sailor uh they should try to get him to at least watch part of this video or or read some of Giovanni's or or my stuff or whatever. I don't. I'm not trying to get more uh, views on YouTube. Although I would love more views on YouTube, but uh, I will say I think it would be great if Sailor got a little bit more of the power law religion. I think he, I think it would be good for the space. But let's keep on hey, going. Hey, I don't hey, want to take too much time. Hey, we may have to. By the way, Giovanni, I think we may have to. I don't know how much longer this is. Yeah, but that's I mean, not, what to do. In, I'm not opposed to doing it in two parts. No, no. In fact, uh, can, let me let me say, tell you. I was thinking that we were going to finish before one hour, but it's almost impossible with me because I'm. No, I'm I think we should do it in two parts. No, but let, let, let me let me say this. Let's end here because actually I have okay. another call. I have actually I'm going to okay. another presentation at 10 so i need to run to that presentation it's a youtube presentation with another influencer so forgive me uh, okay no this. problem let's so let's, let's cut it, it here okay. and then let's meet again uh, in next two days week. and yeah. do uh episode two, okay two. thank you very much i want everybody to thank, thank you Giovanni. thank you everybody to call and we will take your here. question next time so, thanks okay. a lot and i'll post it to youtube as well all right thank you so thanks, much that was fantastic ciao ciao to everybody